perspectives on the news is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning. Welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. I'm Bob Sessions, retired philosophy professor. <clears throat> Most everything we do involves risk. People are injured or even die from things we do every day that are so commonly practiced that we don't think twice about the risks that are involved, such as driving, eating fast food, spraying our lawns with chemicals, or stepping into a bathtub. Until recently, everyone knew that some sports activities are more dangerous than others, but the evidence is growing that football and soccer in particular can be as harmful to the brains of the participants as boxing. Youth leagues are trying to figure out how to reduce the risk of head injuries, and football teams in high school and above are looking hard to find helmet technologies that will diminish the chances of concussions. Both sports are increasingly popular, with college and professional football dominating television viewing and ratings, and more people uh, are participating, which means that the risks overall are increased. How can we assess the risks and benefits to determine whether or not to continue contact sport for our children and for our enjoyment? Should we pull our children off the fields and put them in pools or on tennis courts? Uh, what do we owe the college uh, players who seriously injure themselves for monetary glory or for momentary glory and our pleasure? Should they receive lifelong compensation as the professional world is now contemplating? Also, are we justified in being especially concerned about sports brain injuries, or should we simply allow people to make informed choices about those risks, just as we do regarding risks in other aspects of life? These are not easy issues, but we believe it is time for Americans to take seriously the very real risks that football and soccer players take every time they step on the field. To help us think through these issues, we have three very knowledgeable and thoughtful guests. To my left is Andy Peterson, uh, who is the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Iowa. He's Director of the University of Iowa Sports Concussion Program, Director of Primary Care Sports Medicine, and Team Physician for Hawkeye Football and Wrestling, and also for uh, USA Wrestling. So he's got a lot of uh, pedigree for this particular assignment. Next to him is Jeffrey Lauer, who is the Executive Director of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa. Jeff, thanks for being here. You bet. Thank you. And finally, Devin Smith from, uh, from Cedar Rapids, who's Doctor of Physical Medicine, Doctor of Physical Medicine at St. Luke's Hospital. Did thanks I get that right? Me. Okay. You got it. Very good. So the first question, let's try to get some factual background. Uh, just uh, what do we know about what's happening with head injuries for people in these contact sports, children, but high school people, and then college and professional? You want to start? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a broad question, obviously. We, there's a lot of things we know. There's a lot of things we don't know. Um, we're getting a better idea of the general epidemiology of these types of injuries. That was somewhat in question for quite a while. And I'm, when I talk about these injuries, I'm mainly talking about sport-related concussion. When we talk about other types of traumatic brain injury, they tend to behave a little bit differently than, than sport-related concussion. People that have mild traumatic brain injury without any type of skull fracture or bleeding into the brain, that's a result of these fairly mild traumas that we see um, from playing sports, even contact and collision sports like football and soccer. The types of injuries that people have from motor vehicle accidents and from blast-related concussion and war tend to be different animals. Those, mm -hmm. those tend to behave very differently. And so we really think very specifically about sport-related concussion. The bulk of these injuries are coming from football. You know, we talk about the rates in different sports, but because there's so many participants in football, um, really the bulk of these injuries come from football. And somewhere around 0.6 injuries occur per every thousand exposures, meaning you know, every time there's a practice or, or a competition, about 0.6 of an athlete will be injured in each, in each one of those. Um, soccer is about half of that or two-thirds that um, for women and about a third of that for men. Um, but really from an epidemiologic standpoint, most of this is happening in, in, um, in football. Mm -hmm. And then there's some basic things that we agree on. We generally agree that people need to rest and recover initially afterwards. We agree that there's some role for using some type of aerobic exercise for helping people rehabilitate. And we agree that people should return to sport in a graduated way. Beyond that, there's a lot of disagreement and there's a lot of areas to discuss. Okay. Yeah. Jeffrey, you want to add something? Sure. So I've been in the field of brain injury rehabilitation and prevention for about 30 years, and we've seen and called, uh, we've called the field actually uh, the silent epidemic. 
that this has been a, a hidden injury for many, many years. And I, and I want to emphasize <clears throat> that we take umbrage in the Brain Injury uh, Alliance field to saying head injury. A head injury might be a bloody nose. It might be a gash on the forehead. What we're talking about here is brain injury. I mean, I think the, the fundamental life-changing event that we're talking about that can, um, that, that, that's under discussion for consideration is an injury to what is arguably the most important organ in the body. We know that even though 0.6, um, uh, the rate is 0.6 for football, we also know that the Centers for Disease Control are estimating that over 100,000 high school concussions happen each year. And those are concussions, meaning that these are impacts that result in the signs, symptoms, and behavior of a neurological change and impact. And then on top of that, there are literally millions of sub-concussive events that don't result in a dramatic change in behavior, but the literature and the research is starting to point to may well have life-changing impact through the, um, the advent of chronic traumatic encephalopathy and other early onset uh, type dementias. We know that in the past decade, emergency room visits for concussion and for brain injury have gone up 60%. Mm -hmm. That could be partly due to uh, increased awareness True. about brain injury and probably is. But it also could be due partially to that our athletes, our student athletes and our collegiate athletes are bigger and quicker than they've ever been before. And so we have more force happening on the field. Mm -hmm. Devin? So the biggest change in my lifetime, to kind of go along with your point, mm -hmm. our increased sensitivity to this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the stereotypical, hey, how many fingers am I holding up? Okay, four, good, get back in there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're picking up a lot more uh, brain injuries, and we're also more sensitive to the idea of the chronicity uh, of exposures. So it's not just, did you get knocked out cold? It's, are you getting repeated subconcussive forces? Mm -hmm. And we're really recognizing this chronic traumatic encephalopathy. The CT has kind of come up, especially in the NFL discussions. Mm -hmm. and that's something I wasn't even aware of, you know, in junior high, high school. So there's an accumulative effect. One might not make much difference, but 50, can make a, a big difference in a person's life. Yeah, well, maybe. I mean, that's the tricky part right now. You know, there's not good, solid um, research to prove that. There's an awful lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, you know, the, and, and the accumulation of these anecdotes are, are definitely pushing us in that direction. But it's far from a proven fact that having a handful of subconcussive events from playing contact and collision sports is what's causing chronic traumatic encephalopathy. There is some evidence that it's what causes tau deposition disease, the changes that we physically see in the brain, but whether that eventually de determines what, how people are going to behave and the trouble that they're going to have later on is, is very controversial. I think a good example of this is a study that was done with the Mayo Brain Bank, and they demonstrated that people that play contact and collision sports at the high school and college level, about a third of them develop some type of, of, of tau deposition disease in this very large pathological sample. But they didn't have any different rates of depression or anxiety or mood disorder or dementia or anything like that compared to the normal controls that hadn't played contact collision sports. And in fact, they lived a little bit longer than the people that hadn't played contact collision sports. And so while there is this, this, this growing cohort of people who played, who played you know, especially at the professional level or at the high amateur level, who have gone on to have dementia and other bad neuropsychological problems with tau deposition disease on autopsy afterwards, I, I think it's a stretch right now to say that, that those injuries have clearly caused the troubles that they've had later on in life. It very well could be the case. I, I think most people think that it probably is the case, but we're far from having hard science on but it. I would agree with you, Andy, uh, but I think that in this case, when we've got youth athletes at, at risk, that the precautionary principle yeah. is what we really have to look at from either an ethical, but totally an ethical standpoint. In, and that would say that if we have a, a, an evidence base that is not conclusive, and in fact, if we look at the literature that's you know, been out there for more than a decade, published in the journals of neurosurgery, in the last couple of weeks, it's been called into question in terms of a disingenuous data set that has um, been applied by and supported by a national, the National Football League and others. Um, I think that we really do have the potential for conflict in what is a, a cultural celebration of sports and certain events, and frankly, an economic engine that drives it, with this issue of um, parents and, and youth athletes trying to struggle and make that decision of what is enough evidence to, to go forward with. Well, and I guess not to pile on, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, no, I'm what, what uh, information, <laughs> kind of what I see is kind of a dearth of uh, quantifiable evidence. So there's a lot of qualitative evidence mm -hmm. in the field. You know, we know that there's 
greater chance of tileopathies with repeated exposures. And what you're saying is whether that core or whether that is the cause or a correlation of some of the sequelae that we typically see, what sorts of evidence uh, would it take to convince you, would you need to see like a quantifiable increase, a dose dependence relationship with exposure, more tauopathy, more symptoms, is that kind of what you yeah, find? Yeah, exactly. We obviously need a, a large group of normal controls to be able to make a meaningful, um, meaningful conclusion here. You know, all of this is based on less than 200 cases of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. You know, there's not that many uh, pathologically defined cases that have been, that have been, you know, d determined by the Boston Brain Bank and these other organizations that are, you know, collecting brains from retired NFL players, retired professional boxers, and other retired contact collision sport athletes. And the people that donate their brains are, are disproportionately people that have had trouble, right? They're not people that have felt normal their entire life and then just think, oh, I'm going to donate my brain to science at the end. They're people that have had problems with dementia or anxiety or chronic headaches or whatever and are worried that they have some type of damage to their brain from playing football and are donating their brain. So it's a massively biased sample. And I want to be clear here. I, I'm not arguing that this doesn't exist, right? I, I just want to be very very clear about this. Uh, I, I think we do ourselves a disservice by making bold statements that have major impacts for a national pastime type of game without having strong evidence behind it. I think if we're going to make major changes to these types of sports, we need to have strong evidence to do it. And I, and I would argue back that I think that there is sufficient evidence, and particularly when you look at families um, and individuals who suffer the consequences of early onset um, dementia that they correlate back with these kinds of um, uh, events, NFL players, uh, coll collegiate athletes, and even high school athletes, that the, the impact both at the individual health level, at the family level, at the social level, um, at the kind of the, the group requirement that we cover and support people's health care and a life with long-term disability, uh, there are all those factors that are continuing to grow. Strong evidence, I agree. And I think that there could be, uh, there always will be an argument about when is science, does it have a strong enough evidence? There are still deniers for climate science, and there was a lot of denial for the tobacco, by the tobacco industry for many decades before we all kind of decided, okay. Mm -hmm. and for me, kind of the breakdown is there's a big difference in allowing, you know, uh, a professional who has millions of dollars on the line to make that decision, to make that rational decision for themselves mm -hmm. versus a 10-year-old that wants to impress their dad with you know, by how hard they can hit their opponents. So mm -hmm. it is kind of stratified by age too, I think, or ability to make those more compli complex decisions. Well, can, I, can I make an assumption here, that, and, and that's that given the size and speed and ability and so on of the professional players, they probably are gonna get the hardest hits that are gonna cause the most damage. They do. There's um, also a little evidence that those people are a little bit concussion resistant by the time they get there. Mm -hmm. People that are more concussion prone tend to wash out a little bit mm -hmm. at, the, at the lower level, okay. so it's hard to know whether or not they're really at a higher risk. In terms of the total number of injuries, they're not, right? You know, their risk of concussion per exposure is no different than a high school kid and is really no different than a junior high or, or, or youth football player. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the types of collisions you can see on the youth football field are just as high as what you see at the high school level. There was a very elegant study done last year using accelerometers and helmets that demonstrated that the hits that are happening, the, the, the highest, like 99th percentile types of hits that are happening at the youth level are the same types of impacts that are happening at the high school okay. level. Well, that, that actually sets up my question, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, okay, so maybe the professional players, they're adults, they're making rational decisions, there's a lot of money involved, uh, and so on, okay, so, so taking that risk. Very few people who play football in grade school, high school, or even college make it to the pros, okay? They're playing for entertainment value, for exercise, yep. for their parental uh, bragging rights, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so it seems to me that, that assessing the risk-benefit relationship for all of those up to the pros is a very different game than with the pros. Uh, you know, th think about college football. Come on, let's face it. A high proportion of those players are African American. Okay, often coming from from poor places and so on. This is their one chance to make it to college and perhaps make some money. And their their chances are very slim of going on to make any money. Uh, and so, in a way, they're almost uh, kind of gladiators who are signing up to uh, entertain us with a lot of risk. Okay, no swords, but uh, mm. football helmets are pretty powerful things. Mm. Um, you know, Less immediate is, risk, but yeah. potentially more long. Yeah. And that's, that? that's the disconnect, is that you, you don't see that immediate outcome that we're now starting to suspect could be looking, waiting for people 
5, 10, 15, 20 years later. Yeah. There is actually, I think there's a bit of, uh, the Brain Injury Alliance in 2011 worked with the Iowa legislature to draft and pass the Iowa's youth sports and concussion law. Mm -hmm. And we were really proud about that mm -hmm. initially. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, myself and some colleagues have come to believe that we're a bit naive on that. Relying on legislation um, really can be providing false expectations, uh, significantly false mm -hmm. expectations to parents, families, athletes, coaches, that this is kind of being managed. We have a law right now that requires coaches to go through a basic training to identify the signs, symptoms, and behaviors of concussion and brain injury. That student athletes, if they see those behaviors, signs, or symptoms, get removed from play, and that they are not able to go back into play until a licensed healthcare professional waves that on. Mm -hmm. It sounds and seems like, oh, that should be a good system. Sure. Mm -hmm. However, that may just simply be some, um, you know, some soft coding that we're trying to increase. Um, awareness that will lead hopefully to culture change over time which is frankly what I think is the the, the big answer to all this is culture change but in the meantime um, even though we're putting brain injury on the radar screen I think we're having people feel like oh it's being managed and I don't think it is mm -hmm. there's another point with that it may present uh, somewhat of a, an onerous burden for more rural programs Absolutely. that don't have access uh, and I know even in, in our area, which I don't necessarily consider rural, but there has been some pressure to go provide team coverage uh, uh, to smaller schools uh, to help with like high school football and things like that, mm -hmm. to provide them coverage. And there's a worry, you know, whether a small, you know, resource poor uh, district might have to incentivize uh, professionals to come out and help. Mm -hmm. and, right. Mm -hmm. Could be more of a harm in what, the well, that a technological. I'd, I'd just like to get to that sure. too one second because uh, my yeah. my experience with this has been uh, somewhat different. You know, we started our sport concussion program uh, six years ago, and at the time, boy, people people were panicked, right? You know, the, the, this is you know the front page of the newspaper, like seen every mm -hmm. other week. Though the concussion law got passed, and a lot of these schools didn't know what they were going to do with mm -hmm. these concussed mm -hmm. athletes. And you know what? It's it's been okay. You know, they've kind of figured it out. Most schools have developed their sport concussion program, and everyone is a lot better at basic concussion management than they were five six years. Ago. Everyone knows to remove someone from play when they have signs or symptoms of a concussion. Everyone knows about graduated return to play. And everyone knows where they can turn for for help when they have a case that's out of their comfort zone. So my, my experience with our concussion, sport concussion program is that it's gotten dramatically better. I used to get kind of what I call bread and butter concussion cases through the door all the time. Mm -hmm. Kids that had normal, regular, run-of-the-mill injuries that recovered quickly and spontaneously and didn't have any long-term effects. And now I'm not seeing those because the, the local providers are taking care of those. The high school athletic trainers are taking care of those. Those, the school nurses are taking care of those, and they're doing a really good job of it. You know, I'm seeing mainly really complicated cases that are finding their way to us after it makes its way past that first line. Please. Is there is there data? I mean, as far as outcomes that we can say that because we've put those. Uh, programs in place. I know that's always harder to do. Yeah. So, so the biggest concussion epidemiology studies coming out of high school are done by Lincoln out out of um, out of uh, the Ohio area, and they've demonstrated that there's a dramatic increase in the number of diagnosed concussions in the high school athletic training rooms. No one thinks that the number of concussions is actually increasing in sport. That people are being concussed more now than they were five years ago. Attention. Everyone Absolutely. thinks that this is this is a recognition issue, and the fact that we're recognizing more of these these injuries and we know what to do with them for the vast majority of them, I think, is a dramatic improvement. I don't want to lose track of the strides that we've made. When you say vast majority, I mean, I think we could say majority. I'm sorry, vast majority is not true. Right, 80 you're absolutely right. 80% of people recover, but 20% of athletes, if I'm understanding the, the current statistics, have residual and long-term yeah. challenges from having a concussion. Right. It depends on what athletes you're talking about. So if you're talking about athletes that find their way to an academic sport concussion program, mm -hmm. I agree with you completely. If you're talking about people that are injured in a high school mm -hmm. high school game, 95% of them are asymptomatic at the one-month mark and 99.5% of them are asymptomatic at the six-month mark. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of people recover quickly, spontaneously, and have no long-term effects from it. By the time they find their way to the university, to the ivory tower for management of their concussion, mm -hmm. that's the point into the field, right? Those are people that aren't the run, typical run-of-the-mill concussion case, and they do need extra care, and they do need specialized care. My understanding is that in soccer, there's no a rule, or at least is being considered, that up until the age of something like 12, yep. um, 13, uh, they can't do headers, okay? And in if they do... No, and in competition. In competition. Yep. If they do, they're penalized. You know, Correct. there's a free kick to the other team. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty, pretty strong penalty. Um, in football, uh, you know, the, the, the head is, is a major tool of, of uh, the game. Uh, is there some substantial um, uh, 
research or changes that have happened with the technology, you know, with helmets and so More on. importantly, rule changes. Um, we can get to helmets here in a second, but there's already been rule changes made at the NFL level and at the college level that have made a real difference. The biggest is in the kickoff. So in the NFL, about 40% of concussions were happening on kickoff plays, and they were able to move mm. up the kickoff yard so that more touchdown backs occurred, and that dramatically decreased the number of concussions that are happening in the NFL, mainly by getting rid of about half of the concussions that happened in kickoffs. Wow. Wow. Last year, or two years ago, the NCAA did the same thing, moved up the kickoff, increased the reward for a touchback, so now a touchback is out to the 25-yard line, and there were more kickoff, there were more touchbacks um, over the last couple years than there were returns, and that probably decreases the incidence, although our data in the NCAA isn't quite as strong. But back to your question about helmets, you know, there's no reason to think that any particular helmet is going to do anything to decrease the risk of a concussion. Helmets do a great job of preventing skull fractures, of preventing intracranial hemorrhage, mm -hmm. but they don't do anything to really absorb those sheer forces that come through the brain. They, they diffuse those direct linear forces, and they do a great job of that, and that's why we don't have skull fractures, and that's why we don't have 100 kids a year dying on football fields anymore. Luckily, we have the luxury of worrying about concussion instead of traumatic brain death on the football mm -hmm. field, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a good mm -hmm. problem to have, frankly. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the, these helmets don't do anything to absorb those forces, and no helmet can really be designed that can absorb that force. That still has to get transmitted into the skull unless the helmet crushes in the same way and is, un, and is able to absorb that, that actual energy. The concussion is basically the brain hitting up against the skull. And it's the sheer forces through the yeah. brain. So you know, we talk about those coup, counter coup types of injuries with more severe types of traumatic brain injury, like subdural hematoma or, 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 or actual contusion to the brain tissue. This is more sheer, diffuse forces through the brain tissue that causes direct injuries to the glia and to the neurons themselves rather than bleeding into the brain like we see with more severe types and of traumatic brain injury. I think, as, as Andy is saying, there's the, the diffuse. So brain injury is not just a linear force. Very rarely does a football player or anybody else have a a deacceleration and then a, a counter acceleration bounce back, but there's a shearing and a twisting of the brain. Exactly. Oh, and it's that shearing that doesn't show up often on imaging. The neurons, the, the fibers of the brain stretch, disconnect, and that can lead to a change in um, neurological condition, mm -hmm. neurological status. Mm -hmm. That is sometimes very hard to recover from and then sometimes you know, uh, easier to recover from, but the more concussions that somebody experiences, the less rapidly they tend to recover. I think one of the important points uh, about this is that we want our young people to be exercising. Yes. We want them to participate in sports. Uh, you know, we've got obesity epidemics and we've got people with lifelong problems because they never learned how to exercise well and never learned how to enjoy exercise and so on. And sports is where that, that's learned. Um, are you guys uh, aware of any, Jeff talked about cultural changes, of any cultural changes towards uh, you know, pushing kids into other areas. I, I know in Iowa City there are at least some parents who are saying, I'm not going to let my kid play football, I want them to play tennis or go swimming or, you know, whatever. Are, are you seeing any evidence about this? Yeah, so USA Football had its first decrease in its participation numbers in its entire history last year. It seems to have rebounded a little bit this year, but last year fewer young kids played mm -hmm. um, played football than, than, than had, or had, a, had a step backwards, so it was the first year they'd had a decrease in the numbers. So there does seem to be some cultural shift away from football. Maybe that's because of the media attention. Maybe that's because of the popularity of other sports. Maybe it's because of sports specialization, which is something else that we think of as a bad problem, right? Maybe kids are picking a single sport to play earlier, and so they're not playing football because they're busy playing tennis or wrestling or and also the or multiplication of sports there are so many right. new sports for people to play it's we're amazing. getting more calls at the brain injury lines by worried parents who are trying to find evidence that they can either persuade the other parent or the family members because mm -hmm. you know they, they've got a, a child who seems to want to either play um, football hockey bo boxing lacrosse or the kind of the big ones in fact those are the ones that uh, I think uh, dr. Bennett Omalu who was the um, the featured uh, pro protagonist in the movie Concussion, the 2015 Will Smith movie, so, you know, his suggestion was that kids should not play those sports, period. Um, I think that parents are coming away with a message that there is a, a degree of risk that didn't previously exist or that w people weren't aware of. It might have existed, but now we're aware of it. And then there's this, you know, dynamic of having two values at the same time. We value sports. We value fitness. We value all the great things that come from team sports um, that, that, that our youth learn for a lifetime of physical fitness and interpersonal ability. Mm -hmm. But w how much evidence do I wait for before I decide to make a personal choice in my family with my child? And I see the same thing across the state. We have more and more folks who are questioning 
the data set that's out there, and when do we decide that too much is not, not good? And there is that opposing force, you know, children, you know, especially uh, male children that don't participate in these traditionally masculine mm -hmm. sports can be ostracized to some extent. Indeed. So at what, and you have to weigh that uh, right. risk as well. It's to be a complex question. If you had a child who was, uh, let's say, eighth grade, uh, would you uh, discourage them or refuse to allow them to participate in football or soccer, either one? No, absolutely not. I'd let my kids play. Um, yeah, I, I get asked that, that question a lot. And sure. my personal opinion, and you know, I'm talking for me, not for the University of Iowa or the AAP or anyone, but you know, in my personal opinion, um, I think the benefits of, of playing youth sports clearly outweigh the risk. I think we know that physical activity tracks from childhood to adulthood. We know the benefits of playing sports on, on not just social outcomes, but physical outcomes um, for general childhood health are important. And I think that those benefits clearly outweigh the risks. Okay. I'd agree with Andy that the benefit of youth sports clearly outweigh the risks. And it is a, a fundamental component of childhood development. However, your question was about football. And I'd have to say yes, at this time, they're, uh, given what the sport is and how it's still struggling to adapt to the information and the data set, this would not be a time that I would allow, and we have kids, uh, that I would allow them to play football if I, if I had the control over it. And I, like everything, I would just defer to my wife, so <laughs> I didn't need to make the call. <laughs> nice, nice evasion. <laughs> Let's go back to a point I raised earlier, and that's about uh, compensation, okay? Mm. Uh, do you think that uh, we owe it to uh, the athletes, especially college and then the professionals, to set up a pretty elaborate uh, set of compensations for the risks that they're undergoing? Or do you think uh, this is just something they need to take out insurance for? Yeah, so that, that's challenging, obviously. Um, I, I think that, that there is an issue related to compensation in terms of the hours that our student athletes are, are putting into this, that the time that um, you know, gets taken out of other activities and out, out of you know, schoolwork, frankly, for a lot of our college student athletes. Um, yeah, I think that's one separate issue. In terms of some type of hazard combat pay like we do for, for military, folks, boy, I, I feel like that's a, that's a stretch at this point. There are clearly tangible benefits of playing contact and collision sports, even at the college level, even for people that don't make their way to the to the professional level. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for them to meet a lot of people that have a lot of power and influence and a lot of money, and there's a lot of networking that goes on. And boy, most of our student athletes tend to land well after their careers. You know, they, they find jobs in fields that they enjoy, and they're able to make the connections that help them, you know, live, live, live um, productive and, and generally wealthy lives. I'm curious about that. What are the graduation rates like, uh, say, for football yeah. versus the general population? And even if you stratified that with um, minority students, I wonder if that relation would still hold. Yeah, it, it varies widely uh, from institution to institution. At the University right. of Iowa, it's very good. So we, this is academic progress rate, something that we have to monitor in our student athletes. And ours is among the best in the country. Our athletes tend to graduate at a higher rate than other, other student athletes, somewhere in the 85 to 90% range. But that's not the same as it is at other institutions. And I'm not going to call anyone in particular. Sure. You can look at the Sports <laughs> Illustrated website or Google it out if you want. Um, but we tend to do pretty well with it. And our student athletes graduate at about the same rate as the general population. That's not true everywhere, though. Well, we're about out of time, Jeffrey. I have time for you to give a brief response. Well, I think that the compensation question does come to play because, frankly, we are all um, on the line for long-term services and supports for people. Sadly, in Iowa, there is now a waiting list of three years for community-based services for people with brain injury mm -hmm. um, under the Medicaid waiver, and that's a program that people could get access to uh, it, uh, previously. Um, Jeff, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. No, no worries. Uh, I told you we had some wonderful guests this morning who are very knowledgeable about this field, and I really appreciate uh, Andy and Jeff and Devin joining us this morning. This is a wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah.